politics is hard to write about. It's hard to write about fairly. It's a moving picture. What looks right today can look really wrong in a couple of weeks. It's a game where you expect to make some mistakes and you hope to make just some small ones. Prominent CEOs, leading economists, iconic investors, insights from the experts. The Walker Webcast with Willie Walker. See who's next. Uh, it is a real pleasure to have my old friend, Michael Duffy, uh, not that Michael's old, but we have known each other for a very long period of time, uh, join me on the Walker webcast today. Let me do a quick intro of Michael, and then we're going to dive into a number of different things. Uh, Michael Duffy is the opinions editor at large of the Washington Post. Before joining the Post, he spent over three decades at Time magazine. He joined Time in 1985, where he covered the Pentagon, Congress, the White House, and served as Washington Bureau Chief and Editorial Director of Time, Inc. He has co-authored two New York Times best-selling presidential histories, including the President's Club, Inside the World's Most Exclusive Fraternity. Michael appeared regularly on PBS's Washington Week in Review, as well as other public affairs programs. Along the way, he won two Gerald Ford Awards for Distinguished Reporting and a Shorenstein Award for Investigative Reporting. Michael is a graduate of Oberlin College, he was the Ferris Professor of Journalism at Princeton University and has served on the board of the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press and St. Albans School in Washington, D.C., where we actually sat on that board together. All right, Michael, we're going to get into things at hand today, but I want to back up a little bit here. When you were at Time, you wrote 50 cover stories, I believe. Which one of those in your mind was the most consequential? Oh, I don't know. And consequences are really hard to measure, Willie. Really. Uh, and thank you for having me. I, I think the um, the and when I was writing cover stories for Time, it was at an in an era where Time cover stories really had impact. You know, it was read by four or five million, maybe more people a year. It was kind of a different era, and the cover story really could could you know make waves and change weather. Um, I, I I remember things that probably most journalists would remember. I remember the mistakes and I remember the the oversteps and the, the things that kind of stay with me aren't the aren't the ones that change things. The one they're more like the ones I'd, I'd like to have over. Um, uh, but I think in a real if you if you're lucky, you get a couple in your life that really kind of you know, move the ball or change how people think about something. Um, and, you know, there were there were a couple of those I'm, I'm proud of. I'll say one thing. Uh, politics is hard to write about. It's hard to write about fairly. It's a moving picture. What looks right today can look really wrong in a couple of weeks. Um, and so it's a uh, it, 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 it's a it's a game where you expect to make some mistakes and you hope to make just some small ones. So that's how I kind of think about that, those years and, and those cover stories, which still you can still find today. Let me let me push a little bit further on that, maybe flipping the question to if maybe not, you're going to say which was the most consequential, which one did you get the most blowback from? In other words, which was the one where you wrote it and either the White House called you or the president himself called you and said, what are you talking about? Yeah, or I don't know that they called. I tended to hear about them afterwards. They would throw the thing across the room or something. They'd read them. Um, I, 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 my favorite story about it is with my colleague Dan Goodgame way back during uh, Bush one, Elder Bush, George Herbert Walker Bush. We read something about how his first couple of months were kind of sketchy and they weren't really going in any direction and. We were kind of new to the beat and, and it was a tough piece and he read it and complained and I think he threw it across the room or something like that. But then I ran into him in the White House, which never happens to a reporter. You never just kind of like randomly bump into the president in or outside of that building. Uh, but I did like a week later, which was uh, there he was. And he, he so I, he looked at me and I looked at him and I said, I hear you're upset with us. And he said, oh, I'm not upset. I'm just wondering about uh, what you're thinking. And I said, you know, we went back and forth about the piece and and he was very kind and way too nice to me for the moment. Uh, you know, I, I was thinking his son, George W., would have kind of probably grabbed me by the lapels and pushed me up against the wall and said, what the hell do you know? But his father was much more uh, elegant and and kind. And he said, well, after talking about this piece for four or five minutes, he said, 
we'll try to do better. <laughs> and I thought, you know, you're president. You don't have to say we'll try to do better. But I could see that that at least gotten his attention. I'm not sure uh, we were 100 percent right, but at least I could see uh, he noticed uh, they read. Uh, and, and that that is, a, is sometimes as good as you can do. Talk about that for a second, Michael, in the sense that you talked about running into the president sort of in the hallway in the in, in the West Wing, which rarely happened. Never. I remember distinctly going to the White House for the first time, I think, in Reagan's presidency and sort of the structure around the press area and being let out into the Rose Garden for a photo op with my mom, which you or one of your other Time magazine reporters was there with her. Um, and thinking back whether that was 1982 or 1983, and then now in 2023, 2024, of sort of the relationship between the president and the press corps and the decorum or lack thereof, or the way that the media engages with the president. Talk for a moment about how that's all evolved over the last 40 years. I'm not sure I'm, I, I can do it. I can do it perfectly, but I can tell you that you know it was uh, 50 years ago. Um, a much smaller group of people covering the White House um, tended to be newspapers and radio and a little television. Um, now it's a lot of bloggers and a lot of cable networks and 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 people in the newspaper and radio businesses are, are much less important. I'd say I'm betting um, the the. The each president, depending on who it is, has his or her own relationship with the media. It's very much personality driven. Some presidents want to, you know, get to know them and 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 even have them over socially. Um, George Herbert Walker Bush was classic in this respect. Others keep them at arm's length. Um, the staff is an interfering factor. They they are positioned between where the press is allowed to sit and where most of the work in the West Wing gets done. Um, but generally, it's a you're kind of a caged animal. You you sit in your it's very small, not particularly nice, you know. Uh, uh, cubicles and 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 you wait to be called. You wait until they are ready to say something or want to say something, and that's uh, and then everyone dashes madly. The best reporters are constantly on the phone, calling inside the West Wing and elsewhere in the executive branch and government, trying to find out what's going on. It's a it's a tough line of work. It's not easy. It's hard to find things out. It's hard to confirm things to be sure you're right. Um, I can't stress that enough. You can hear all kinds of things, but being absolutely certain that they're true is a uh, really different picture. And most of the people who do this well work really, really hard, 100 hours a week, every day. Uh, so uh, it's not, uh, I mean, it's there are people who go there and 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 get get the assignment and just kind of write it. And but the best reporters are on the phone all day, every day, um, sun up to sundown and 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 they're and they're competing with the best so it's a it's a tough place to work it, very little is handed out that's useful or valuable uh without a fight your book with nancy gibbs the president's club talks about the most exclusive fraternity i guess in the world uh as it relates to former president of the united states um, I want to dive into a number of the anecdotes that you have in that to get a sense of these incredible leaders that you and Nancy spent a bunch of time with. Who seemed to be, of the presidents you interviewed, Michael, the most appreciative of the life that he had lived? The life that they had lived as an, as just that. that without moment. Talking so about you're done with the presidency, you're out of the presidency, you're sitting there and you're the most appreciative of the opportunity you've had, the ability to make an impact, all that. Well, I think the person who studied his life the closest, who who thought about it the most, um, was one of the least successful presidents, Jimmy Carter. I th he, he after leaving the White House, uh, to his surprise, he was thrown out after one term. You know, he spent the next 30, 40, 50, still alive, years uh, contemplating what it meant to be an ex-president and how to contribute this uh, further. And that that he really changed what it meant to be a former president, I think, because he spent so much time thinking about how lucky he had been. Grew up relatively poor in Georgia, went to the Naval Academy, got a ride on Admiral Rickover's atomic, early atomic submarines. Uh, and, and, and then he went back to Georgia uh, and became a farmer and eventually got into politics in a time when the, Georgia and the South was going through this huge civil rights upheaval. 
I think Carter spent the most time thinking about his history, his life, uh, what he'd been given, what he made of it. He wrote many of his books are about him um, from different perspectives, religious perspectives, literary perspectives, um, historical perspectives. I think he was probably the most self-conscious of the presidents um, I, I, I got to know or covered or interviewed. Um, uh, and, so, and that got sometimes was more than anybody wanted. It, 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 he was quite self-conscious, maybe too much so, um, and, it, and it hurt him politically. Uh, so I think uh, he's a real candidate for that. A, a lot of them, as uh, the elder Bush liked to say, thought, you know, 90% of life is just showing up. Um, uh, or you, you don't think about it too much, just follow the lead. And and that, for a lot of them, George W. Bush, I think, um, Clinton obviously had a much more checkered and complicated life, uh, barely knew, never really knew who his dad was. Um, uh, as, you write, as you write in the book, you, you, you quote the speech that, uh, that, that well, you, you, you note in the book that George H.W. Bush was sort of the father that he never had and that Clinton never sort of pushed back on that concept. That's right. Uh, that, that was the family joke, uh, you know, the mother, the brother of a different mother. That's how the, the, the Bushes thought about Clinton. Um, you know, Richard Nixon had a very... Uh, hard scrabble upbringing. I didn't spend a lot of time thinking about it, but it definitely affected how he operated as a, as a politician, as, a, as an adult, it, and eventually it partly got him in trouble. Um, uh, and Gerald Ford's own uh, um, family life was extremely complicated as a child. So, so they all come from different um, backgrounds, and, and I think some of them want to think about it and some of them don't. Start a legacy. Start turning dreams into realities. A better world begins with you. Better communities start with us. You write that no club in America would have all of them in the sense of how diverse a group of people and backgrounds and personality types it is. And that that in and of itself is somewhat reflective of our country and how incredible it is the types of leaders we have. Yes, when you know um, a couple, of, I would say a decade or so, um, the the French um, elected a, a prime minister who, for the first time in a generation, had not gone to all the right schools and not come from the right families and not had the right jobs, and it was something of a crisis in Paris. And I can't remember the exact name of the French prime minister, unfortunately. But it got me to thinking, oh my God, we're so different. You know, if you looked at the lineup of Nixon to Ford to Carter to Reagan to Bush and Bush and Clinton and Obama and Trump, and I've left one out in there somewhere. Um, th th there is no unifying uh, feature to any of it. It's just a reflection of just how wild, motley, and diverse this country is, and it's becoming more so, and I suspect so will our presidents. Uh, so they're bound together not by who they are or where they came from, but by the fact that they sat in this chair, dealt with some of the impossible choices, I have to say, got bruised and scarred in ways none of us will understand, but they all understand. And that's what has in the past, not recently, but in the past, bound them together in a sort of you know, common purpose to preserve the powers of the office. There are a couple in the book, you dive in on a couple relationships, Carter Ford and then into Bush one Clinton. Talk for a moment about Carter Ford and how two people who, well, Carter beat Ford. And so he, Ford had to deal with that as it relates to you beat me. How did the two of them come together to forge their relationship? And then we'll go to uh, uh, Bush one and, and Clinton, which is the, the odd couple seemingly of them all that really was one of the more deep relationships that you write about. The, one of the curiosities about these guys who've had this job is that they tend to get along better when they're from opposite parties. The guys, so far only guys, uh, who do not get along are the ones who came up both as Republicans or both as Democrats. There's just too much competition. And this goes on until they die. I mean, it, it never really ends. It's it's There's always edginess between, say, a Clinton and a Carter uh, or a, a Bush and now Obama Nixon. Biden. Now Obama Biden. Here's Obama. Oh, yeah, that like, was always you know. there. Uh, Obama Biden has always been edgy, and and Nixon Reagan was edgy, and and so th there's a lot in inside the party. They tend not to, you know, 
bond. They they don't tend to be bros. But between parties, there's all this extraordinary chemistry where they kind of understand each other and they finally meet someone who they can you know kind of talk to. This was true of Nixon and Clinton as well. Those two guys. I mean, it's just amazing how they got along. But in Ford and Carter's case, they ran against each other. Uh, Carter beat Ford, and they didn't talk for I don't know five or six years at all until Reagan sent them both to Sadat's funeral in '81. They spent like 19 hours together on on Air Force One. They they realized they had many of the same problems putting together their libraries raising money for them you know dealing with their spouses they they actually had a fair amount in common and then they went on to do like 30 projects together a lot of them in this country a lot of them overseas um and it got to the point where ford asked carter to deliver his eulogy which would have been unthinkable in 1976 unthinkable and and carter took that uh, very uh, did that very proudly uh and took it very personally and and it was a, a uh, just a sign that we are able to get along when we try. Um, and the same with Clinton and Bush. Clinton, of course, beat Bush in, in 92. Uh, again, another one-term president. Um, and yet uh, those two, with a little help from Bush too, uh, were sort of partnered in harness on all kinds of uh, charitable work through the 1990s and 2000s uh, uh, until uh, Bush died in, in 1919. So, so I'm sorry, 2019. And so, uh, uh, again, unlikely buddies, and, and they would visit each other, and they would uh, call each other, and they would look out for each other. And Bush was constantly telling Clinton to go see doctors before Clinton needed to see doctors. Uh, uh, and so there was a kind of, uh, I want to say best friends, because that's overstated the case, but they were they were certainly um, uh, partners in all kinds of efforts, both uh, personal and broader. And I, and I think that shocked everyone. So um, again, cross parties easier than inside the parties, uh, which again is a model for us, Willie. It reminds me a little bit of John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, who, as as you very well know, were great pen pals and ended up dying on the exact same day, July 4th. Um, and uh, just how their relationship, obviously, in a very different era as it relates to communication of having to send each other actual letters rather than an email or a text. But uh, And I think it has to have to do with the fact that, there, you know, there's a only, what is it? We're in 45, 46, however many, there are only... Uh, less than 50 people have had this job. There's an unusually large number of them still alive for as history goes. But but someone who worked with four of them closely told me, you know, you go through crap in that job that makes it almost impossible for anyone to understand what's required. You, and as he put it, you can't even talk to your, your spouse about most of this stuff. And the only person, people who really understand what it's like to sit in the chair are the people who have sat in the chair before you. Um, uh, and because they've been through it all, they've seen all the absurd, impossible trade-offs, the, the choices that even if you make the right one, you're going to get, you know, half of it wrong. You know, by the time most decisions, as CEOs know, by the time most decisions get to the top, the, the, the easy choices have long ago been made. And, and that's what these guys have to choose from. And they're usually often no winners uh, and they get blamed. And, 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 the, and that stuff sticks, right? I mean, it's a little different to make a decision as president than it is in any, we're all leaders of something, even if it's just our own selves. But there's those decisions have, have vast impact, and they have to live with them for the rest of their lives. That the, the sense of the exclusivity of the club and the experiences does remind me one of my mother's favorite pictures is on Clinton's last morning in the Oval Office before he went up for the inauguration of George W. Bush. And on the 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 desk in the Oval Office is is a letter that he wrote to George W. Bush. But in that letter, he put a copy of the letter that George W. Bush's dad had written to Clinton. And I just I thought about that kind of how neat and exclusive is that, that a father wrote the letter to Clinton and then Clinton wrote a letter to the son and the three of them in that. One of the things you raised, Michael, as it relates to George W. Bush and Bill Clinton 
is that they sort of came from the, you know, they're sort of polar opposites of the baby boom generation. How is their relationship, even though it was W, as you mentioned previously, who sort of put HW and Clinton together when they went over and did the tsunami right. relief effort, which is what really right. started the relationship. But how have W and uh, President George W. Bush and Bill Clinton gotten along subsequent to, you know, this great relationship between H.W. Bush and Clinton? You're right. W gets credit for putting his father and Clinton together. Um, you know, I think Nancy and I interviewed Clinton uh, and Bush together in Houston about, I would say, in 2016. I'm, I'm almost certain your mother was there to take those pictures. Um, and and who, and she did a fabulous job, of course, I got to say, working with Diana is I, I wish I could do it over and over. Um, uh, the fascinating thing about that interview was W was pretty, we were asked at that time Hillary was running again uh, was running for the nomination against Trump. Oh no, it was earlier than that. Hillary was in the run and running, and so was Jeb. And we, but we were really asking Clinton questions about what it was like to have his wife now run. And W could see what we were doing in the issue. You know, we're kind of zoning, we're kind of drilling in on Clinton, saying, well, "What is this like?" And does it make you feel comfortable? And what about this? And 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 and. My favorite part of the session was that Bush would then step in in front of the questions that we had asked Clinton to sort of answer them, saying, I got this. I'll take this one off your hands. I'll, I'll protect you here. They were they, He was literally interposing himself in front of Clinton because Clinton, there was no way to answer some of the questions without upsetting someone. Uh, and uh, which reminded me of what Clinton had done for his father five years earlier uh, when they were working on stuff. So it was quite sweet, again, across parties, to have W, who hasn't been real public, who stayed out of the limelight, who's really made an attempt to just um, step away from any kind of public uh, uh, position or even profile, uh, to in that session step in and say, I know what you're doing, here's the answer. <laughs> Drove me crazy. It was great. So, um when you and Nancy back in 2012 uh, were talking about the book, uh, there was a speech that you both gave where both of you talked about the character that we elect as president and talking about how important, you know, our most important decision as citizens is to go vote. And at that time, the two of you were focused on Mitt Romney and Barack Obama, two wildly accomplished, relatively young um, established leaders. And I sit there and think about where we are today. And it reminds me of the talking head song. How did we get here? Um, <laughs> it, it's the question everyone in America is asking. It is. It, it is. Very much is. How did we get here? Um, in 2015, Michael, you interviewed Karl Rove. And you asked Rove, do you think that Trump gets the nomination? And Rove at that time incorrectly said, no, I don't think he can do it. But he did in that interview with you put forth the broad, if you will, landscape of why Trump could win. Yeah. Um, talk about that for a moment, because Rove was wrong on the, with the specifics, but right on the generalities. Right. I mean, I think Rove sensed... Uh earlier than most that America was about to enter a fairly well yeah I think he even said we're all we're heading into a populist era where where the extremes of both parties are going to be more powerful than they have for the last 50 or 60 years he cited first I remember uh how the left was gaining strength inside the Democratic Party and with with more subtlety talked about how uh in the Republican Party, Elements which had not been at the forefront were becoming more predominant, particularly with respect to immigration um, and crime. And I also think economics. Uh, he sensed early that the uh, previous couple of presidents, I guess he'd probably include Bush in this, although I don't know, uh, had let the working class fester without the economic supports that it had been promised by the government in the wake of NAFTA and globalization and the rise of China. Carl talked about all of that and how it could have a deep, I think he said, 
deeply disruptive or something like that. He was careful um, impact on our politics. And and Rove, being a Republican, particularly with W, particularly coming from Texas, understood, I think, better than most uh, how big that potential force on the on Republican politics could be and how it could spread to the Democratic Party, which it more than has. So um, he was reluctant. You know, there's a, there was a lot of there was and is a lot of opposition inside that kind of Bush world to Trump. It's 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 not discussed much, but it's there. And I think he was worried about it, but he could see the bigger forces that were, I think, poised to, I would say, emerge, but I, you could say explode. Yeah, it's interesting that you that you talk about Rove's view of things because I mean, how quickly our politics have evolved. One of the things that is quite I find shocking is that in two thousand, Rove and George W. Bush decided to focus on West Virginia, and up until two thousand, no Republican first term Republican had won the state of West Virginia. Incumbents had won it, but nobody hit a Republican, first time Republican. It was a solid blue state. And Rove and Bush won it in 2000, which was a key factor in making it so that Florida was the the, the true swing state, if you will. Um, And you think about today, West Virginia being not solidly red, you know, blood red, and how that promise to middle class America has been squandered and lost by the Democratic Party and picked up by this more populist Republican Party. I don't think Obama really has gotten the discredit he deserves for not paying more attention to that, paying more attention to democratic politics. As a president, you, know, you can usually rely on an incumbent president or a sitting president to, to, to nurture and take care of grassroots and statewide, state local, state and local politics inside his party. Obama didn't. There was not a lot of sign that he cared about it. Um, and I don't think he's really gotten the criticism that he probably deserves for it. But the roots of those, that discontent and that populism goes back to you know, really goes back to NAFTA, which was started by Bush one and and uh, put in place by Clinton. I mean, it was a thirty year trend, and you know, even now, uh, I think the Clinton people were wrestling as Clinton approaches the end of his life how they're going to explain uh, the the impact NAFTA and granting most favored nation status to China will have on his legacy because they really were devastating to core democratic constituency uh, constituents and and the republicans moved in on them and now have a huge advantage with white working class uh non college voters so um i want to your your comment on China reminds me a little bit of the speech that the president of Argentina gave at the World Economic Forum. And you interviewed Klaus Schwab a couple of years ago talking about what the major issues were. And he, he correctly identified machine learning and artificial intelligence as a big issue, climate is a big issue, and then the rising China. And I found the 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 speech by the president of Argentina, who is completely reorienting. Argentina saying, you know, we don't, we shouldn't be friends with China. We shouldn't be friends with communist and socialist states. We should be friends with Israel and the UK and the United States of America, democracies that represent capitalist society and ideas and growth and freedom. Um, and it's it's such a significant shift. And I, to anyone who's listening today who hasn't listened and watched his speech, um, I would I would strongly recommend it. Whether he can survive in Argentina, I think, is a big question. But boy, oh boy, hearing him to some degree articulate a, a worldview that has been very different from what's been sort of espoused for the last 20 years. I mean, I was yeah. very surprised by that speech at the World Economic Forum. And sort of if you think about that meeting, Michael, and your interview with Klaus Schwab as it relates to the real issues that are coming up, I thought that might be a marking point of some type of long-term change as it relates to developing nations looking to democracies once again, rather than to dictatorships and and, and socialist countries. Am I, am I being too hopeful? I think I, it's a little hopeful, but I agree that it's totally refreshing. And I wish American politicians were saying the same things out loud. Neither Biden or Trump seems able to put those kinds of words together and pr- provide that kind of positive leadership for people. I, I am struck by how you can't distinguish, for example, between Trump 
and Biden on trade anymore. They both seem to be for slapping all kinds of restrictions on, on trade with China. Um, this is, again, 20 years after both parties were totally for free trade with China. Now both parties are totally against free trade with China. So our own, you can hear or see the parties scrambling to catch up with where voters have been for, as you noted, 15 or 20 years. They don't quite know how to do it. There are positive um, uh ways to to show and take leadership here but you what we what we hear from the two candidates is here's what we shouldn't do not really what we should so so i am uh I, on that score quite disappointed i'm not saying you're over optimistic but i think i'd mark you down as optimistic <laughs> So, but I think it's better to be optimistic, Willie. Don't, I mean, don't, don't, you know, I, or or you know, I think you got to be right. It's just it's 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 a, it's more of a struggle than it used to be. Yeah, I, I but, you know, sticking with the World Economic Forum for a moment because you may have seen Jamie Dimon's comments at the World Economic Forum on CNBC where he said, you know, uh, you can give Trump a lot of you know a, a lot of flack for this and that, but if you think about where he was on China, where he was on the economy, where he was on border security, he has those big issues taken care of. And uh, listening to Jamie say that, I sat there and said, you know, hey, guess what? Directionally, on some of these big issues that seem to be top of mind and people want solutions on them, Trump clearly seem to be focused on them and doing things against them, whereas the Biden administration has struggled to make a case as it relates to their economic success, their success against China, and clearly on border security. Um, and then, Michael, as I was getting ready for this, I went back and read your interview with Bob Woodward after he had written his book, Fear, Trump in the White House. And I had forgotten, I had forgotten sort of what's in that book. And so let me let me go to you for a moment, because one of the things that I think is important for everyone to think about, and this is kind of removing the politics of it and going to just the practical research that Bob Woodward did. I mean, here's one of the great you've won awards for all of your research and investigative reporting. Bob Woodward is known as the investigative reporter all the way back to Watergate to today. You can discount half of what he writes in the book and you're still going to come up with firsthand accounts of what it was like to be in the Trump White House. Let me let me go to you and just go through a little bit because you sit in his kitchen in Washington and have him tell you face to face some of these encounters that make my eyes spin in reading what you wrote about. I mean, that book was astonishing because he had such uh, unparalleled access to Trump and he had him on tape and he released the tapes of Trump talking about it, um, which was really a completely different experience, even if you're a Woodward fan, to hear the voice, to hear the conversation, to hear the back and forth between the, the, the best reporter of his generation, maybe of several generations, and a president who was very, I think, who was sometimes difficult to understand. Uh, there's no question that Trump has capitalized on the public anxiety about the economy, about immigration, and, and about crime. Um, what we, and, and Biden as president, while he has made moves and all those, has gotten um, almost no credit or uh, not been able to convince the public that he's made a difference on any of them, right or wrong. So it's always easier to be running against than to be sitting in power. Um, uh, and I think the polls reflect that. Uh, what I remember most about the Woodward back and forth with Trump was about uh, COVID and uh, Trump's candid comments to Woodward that he really didn't want to believe it at first. Uh, he wasn't sure if it was a Chinese thing, but that didn't matter. He just wanted it kind of to go away, um, his resistance to taking it seriously, um, and then moving to actually take it seriously and pushing the vaccines along, which did occur. Um, and and his, his belief that it was probably overblown, uh, those were revealing conversations which were released a year or two later um, after a million people had died. Uh, Trump doesn't get blamed for that, but I think Woodward was showing in a way that few reporters ever get to uh, how the presidential mind works iteratively, not in a straight line. It's, it's always 
Everybody zigs and zags their way to solutions and decisions. Uh, but Trump's, I'm not sure I can even do them justice, but Trump's, you felt at that point like you were having, you were doing a biopsy of someone or a vivisection. You were, you were inside Trump's brain for hours on end. And it's, a, it's worth going back and listening to those tapes because especially now that he's running again, to remind yourself how his brain works. It's yeah. quite something. We won't get that again. That will never happen again, Willie. No president, former president, or future president is ever going to open himself up to a taped conversation like that again. So in Woodward's book, he also says that, that the you know the president that you you report on this as you as you talk about the book, that you know, when Trump came into office, there were really three factions inside of the White House. And you had sort of the old school Republicans, you had the Steve Bannon group, and then you sort of had the more progressive group and that they they were kind of warring factions about which direction the administration would go. And they were all kind of having this internecine war to try and figure out who could win and push the president in the right direction. And as we as we now know, nobody won. <laughs> the person who won was Donald Trump. But right. in that description, there's a there's a lot about the president undercutting and insulting the people around him. And one of the big questions that I have now, Michael, is if Trump wins, who goes to work for him? Right. I mean, I don't think he's going to make the mistake he made the first time, which is to bring in the establishment of Republicans who absolutely went in in order to keep the trains running on time and to keep the ship in the channel. They won't come back. Um, the progressive group, and, I, and it was hard to know exactly who that represented, but his his daughter and and son in law were certainly in that in that pack. Aren't likely to come back. Um, uh, but he surrounded. I think you can look to his campaign for hints, Willie. You know, he surrounded himself with a uh, extremely professional bunch of political pros who know the rules, master the rules, change the rules, are are playing for keeps, and are not um representing anybody but trump and so i think we've already seen him move from uh certainly having factions try to help him to having one group that is devoted entirely and whole, solely to him and i suspect he'll keep that some of the folks who would not have gotten past the establishmentarians or the progressives inside the trump white house will get in this time you know, heaven only knows what that will mean for policy. Uh, but and he said, you know, I'm not going to make the mistakes I, I made before by trusting, you know, the Reince Priebus's and the the John Kelly's and the uh, the folks like who he thought, I think, and others thought would keep the ship from running aground. I, I think we're in a completely different, if Trump wins, we're in a completely different landscape where there are no governing governors, you know, governors, people who can keep it in a narrow range, uh, acceptably uh, moderate range. I don't think that's likely. I think it's quite the opposite. I think it's really, uh, you know, it's no holds barred. So, uh, We'll see how who he surrounds himself. We'll see when he picks a vice president what he might be thinking. Um, but you know, we're uh, hard to know yet. I'm just I'm not. I think those days are gone. After Nikki Haley lost to none of these candidates with sixty three percent of the vote in Nevada yesterday, and Nikki Haley getting thirty percent of the vote, um, is it over? As it relates sure, to, looks any, that way to me, I don't think she's going to get. Yeah, I think it. I think it's over. He's he's ahead of her two to one in her home state. Um, she has the money from all kinds of sources to stay in it longer. And if I were her, I'd probably stay in in case something happened to Trump. There's no downside to staying in, especially if someone else is footing the bill and there'll be people to pay for it. Um, on a national basis or in most states, Trump is ahead three or four to one. Uh, some states more than that. So, yeah, it's over unless something happens to Trump. And that's the that's the string she's pulling. She's and she, as long as she has money to pay for her, she'll get the press attention for free. And um, so, you know, it doesn't take that long to to win a majority votes in the Republican primary because there are fewer delegates at stake. Super Tuesday is coming up fast. Uh, and so, you know, another month, perhaps. Probably. And for a moment, turning to Biden and um, 
that nominating process. I mean, we've got a couple independents out there that everyone says is going to hurt Biden and, and help Trump um, putting the, the independents to the side. Dean Phillips, um, does he have any 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 shot at gaining any momentum between now and the uh, and the convention? I think that race is over, too, although I would pay close attention to the the uh, Michigan primary later this month. I think it's the 20, it's like a few days after South Carolina. I think it's the 22nd, 7th, but I'm not sure. It's important because, you know, in 2016, Trump beat Clinton basically by winning three states, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan. Um, in 2020, Biden won those three back. And by a margin of something like 75,000 votes, he won the presidency. Um, those three states really matter. And at the moment, uh, Wisconsin is probably leaning Biden. Pennsylvania is probably leaning Biden. But Michigan is definitely plus five Trump. So, you know, the three states to if you had to if you had to close your eyes for nine months and wait until November, all you really need to keep an, an eye on here are Wisconsin, Pennsylvania and Michigan. And among those, Michigan's the most important, not only because it used to be the most reliably Democratic, but because it's trending toward Trump now in all the statewide polls. Remember, these races aren't, it is not a national campaign. It's 50 statewide races. And the way we're divided means it's really only a half dozen statewide races that really decide these things. And among those states, those three are the most important. And among those three, Michigan's by far the most important. And 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 that's made more complicated this year by what's going on in Israel and Gaza because Michigan has the highest percentage of uh, Muslim American voters in the country and they are restive and not pleased with Biden. So he has a real problem in Michigan, but, you know, and the Michigan primary, which is kind of the dress rehearsal, is later this month on the 27th. Um, last time Biden won the Michigan primary, he beat Bernie Sanders with less than a million votes. It'll be interesting to see how many votes Biden gets in that primary where he's facing those two guys you mentioned or he didn't mention. But so that's a that's a real marker coming up in February in this campaign. And if I were if I had one thing I'd like to know the answer to today that's happening in February in politics is what will the turnout be for Biden in Michigan? Is is that the reason that Whitmer continues to circulate as a, as, as a potential candidate is because there is that focus on those three states as being the kind of the swing states right now. And then what is with- a factor? But yeah, she's popular and, and, and she could probably carry that state. There's all kinds of names are circulating because people are so unhappy with the choices. Right. Yeah. I mean, so, I, mean I, I can't go out my door without somebody saying, really, is this the best you've got? Like it's my, like it's my fault. Um, uh, you know, uh, Maybe if you'd written a little bit harder about one or one, one or all of them, we wouldn't have them. Um, and I'm surprised as it relates to Michigan, Biden trailing, given all of the support he's given to the unions and the 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 uh, automobile workers. It's just table stakes, Willie. That he's got to do that just to be competitive in those states. You know, it doesn't actually gain him any great big advantage. And I, my guess is, well, Michigan has a huge union percentage of, of of voters who are union members or live in union households. It's not a majority. Um, uh, you know, there are only fifteen or tw- maybe less percentage of Americans who are actually in unions now. Unions are very popular. Being in a union, not very popular. Key distinction. Uh, they're popular as, as ideas, as, as something you the, the, you ask people if they support unions, they say, absolutely, it's like four to one. If you ask people if they want to be in a union, it's like one to four. So, uh, you know, uh, and Michigan probably isn't as unionized as it was last week. So, you know, I, I just, I, I think you can overstate that. Um, the thing you hinted at, though, that is interesting is whether it's Jared Polis in Colorado or uh, Gavin Newsom in California, or Whitmer in in Michigan, um, uh, Shapiro in, in in Pennsylvania. The Democrats have a huge and uh, extremely competent next class of people coming up behind the eighty one year old. Uh, their their state, their governors, they're all up for most of them in, in the next cycle. They're all going to be raising money. Everyone's already watching them. Whatever happens in this election, you know the farm team is on the on the D side at the moment, um, but none of them are big enough or strong enough to actually uh, shove Biden aside. So 
I think the polling is that 70% of Americans are disappointed that we have Trump and Biden at the top of the two tickets. I think the price is not higher. Yeah, it's some, some around there. There, there are thirty percent who are really, really excited. Um, but that then leads to this sort of um, parlor game, parlor conversation of well, what could happen between now and November to shake this up? Um, is there any? I mean, the 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 one two weeks ago was that Biden says I'm not going to I'm going to step down and give all of my um, electoral votes to uh, Michelle Obama. Um, I had it. Can I can I can I can I bet someone that that's not going to happen? I mean, I'd, I'd love to get a little of that action. That'd be great. Yeah. That, oh, yeah. This, oh, we're now in the far fetched scenario part right. of the conversation. Yeah, OK, but, good. Keep but going. The issue with it is, is that that's where everyone is right now. So in other words, you're basically saying forget about the far fetched scenarios. You shouldn't spend any time on it because at the end of the day, it's going to be Trump v. Biden unless Biden has a health issue. Or Trump is convicted. Is that a is that a is right. that a we finish? basically have a race between a man who's 81 and another man who has 81 criminal counts against him. Right. right. So it's not exactly, you know, they, they, they I here, both parties have endless detailed rules, policies, and procedures for dealing with uh the far-fetched scenarios if say one of these guys has to step away before the convention, if one of them has to step away during the convention, if something has to be done to the tickets after the convention, they have all these rules, all these procedures, all these, it's all written down and there are four or five, maybe six experts on it in the country who can tell you what they are, maybe fewer. What we don't have is any experience with it. Neither party has had to make a change since 1972 when George McGovern decided to, to shove Tom Eagleton off the ticket and replace him with Sergeant Shriver. And that was in a time, Willie, when the public trusted the establishment, trusted the elites, trusted the elders in the party to do the right thing and make the kind of decisions that were in the best interest of the country. There's nobody in either party who thinks that the party elders, whether it's the Republican Central Committee or the superdelegates on the Democrats, have any standing to make any decisions anymore. So even if the far-fetched scenario takes place, and even if those policies and protocols and practices have to be invoked, it's not at all clear to me that either party would accept what the powers that be inside of them um, decide. It's just a really much more hostile anti-establishment era, as you know, and I think it's anybody's guess what might happen. All of that makes me think we're not going down that road. So it's I'm sorry to say it's Trump v. <laughs> Biden, November I, 2024, and we'll see where it all ends up. Yeah, if I thought that was going to change, I, I I'd have probably said something earlier. I, I really do think we're stuck here. I think that's what is making people so frustrated and uh, have them pull out their hair if they have hair. And I, I also think that um, uh, the the mood is such that uh, it will be really difficult to bring about uh, an alternative ticket for either party. No, you know, by the way, changing the ticket after, say, March isn't something either party wants to do. It's like no one goes out and wants to have a skiing accident. You know, that's not something people get up in the morning and want to do. And these parties don't want to shift. They 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 don't want to change the the power structure and the financial donor base is, is locked in on these two guys. Uh, uh, and if anything, um, both sides think they have their best candidates, right? The voters don't think that, but the parties think, oh, these are our best candidates. I know now that, 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 that yes. there, your face tells me that you actually heard that, right? Yeah, no, no, this, no, no. I, I mean, the, they think they've got their best guys. They're bet. They're the bet. Let the best pitcher pitch. Yeah. Um, right. Makes me, makes me think back <laughs> on one thing as it relates to the best ticket and best team and making changes. Um, there's been plenty, obviously, of criticism about Kamala Harris as vice president and lots of people saying, you know, if people had more confidence in the vice president, they'd sit there and maybe give Biden a little bit more of a hall pass for his 81 years old and that they'd sit there and have some confidence there. Um, I'm just curious, did George H.W. Bush try to get rid of Dan Quayle in the 92 election? Question. 
Every president has at some point contemplating dumping his Veep. Almost every one. You know, Nixon dumped Agnew. You know, I uh, there was a the uh, Bush thought about losing quail and they actually have a lunch to discuss it at one point um uh i don't think obama really he would never have abandoned biden but i don't think there was a whole lot of love between those two guys uh w w there was a moment there where w thought cheney was just becoming ridiculous crazy uh, uh, and I don't even think he was up for re-election when it happened. I th I just that all these guys get sick of their running mates and think about it. But the, again, the price is really high, and uh, so uh, I think that's f fair. That's where we get into this piece of politics that that you, people don't write about very much. Just the human frailty piece of politics. You know, they're, 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 we get fed up with our, our, our partners and friends from time to time. And then that happens in this too. Uh, so, um, but I don't think that's going to happen here. I think the, the black vote is way too important. The price of, uh, of, of moving Kamala aside would be way too high and probably finish him if he isn't finished. Um, and uh, if he got to the point where he felt that was going to help him, he's probably already done. So I don't see that happening uh, there. And it would set off a battle royal. It, it, there would be more trouble than it's worth. So uh, that's not going to happen. I'm, again, I'm, I'm really trying to pour cold water on all the far-fetched far scenarios. The, the one thing in the polls that makes me think they want, that Trump isn't going anywhere either is that, um, you know, he's ahead in almost all these statewide polls by margins that are surprising people. Um and if the only thing in the polls that suggest that he would have a problem is that he, if he is convicted of one of these in one of these criminal cases before the election, and then in six or seven of the battleground states, Trump's numbers really do go south. Uh, but I don't see Donald Trump as the kind of person who's going to step away from a chance to get even. Yeah, I um I, I highlighted at the at the top, Michael, that you wrote over 50 Time Magazine covers, and you went to the point that, you know, way back when Time was really the most influential um, publication, clearly on a weekly basis that there was. Um, you're now at the Washington Post, and I'm just curious your thinking as it relates to consolidation of particularly print media, and more kind of to the point, ownership by these billionaires. So Bezos at the Post and Musk at X and Murdoch at, at News Corp slash Washington, uh, the, the Wall Street Journal. Um, any concerns on your part as it relates to consolidation of media and ownership by billionaires? Well, I think the alternative is not existing. So uh, my 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 concern about- so better to have it under that kind of structure than not have it at all? Given the choice. <laughs> you know, um, uh, so I-, I the, the time got bought by Mark uh, Mark Benioff, uh, who runs Salesforce, uh, and he's he's kept it alive, and I'm grateful for that. Uh, Jeff Bezos has done the same at the Post, um, and I'm sure there's there a similar situation exists at the LA Times. That hasn't prevented any of these organizations from from having to keep an eye on its on their P and Ls and watch their bottom lines and make reductions. Uh, as in order to keep the things profitable or as close to profitable as the owners will permit. Um, this is still a very, you know, the, the economics of this line of work is, uh, this is not any better than it was a decade ago. It's a tough business. It's gotten a lot tougher. And everybody is more mindful of that now than they were certainly when I left time uh, eight or nine years ago. Are they mindful enough? I'm guessing not. Um, so I think all these titles have a challenge. Uh, to kind of answer your question, I don't think any of them are thinking about print as the as the goal anymore. I think that's, that those are those are increasingly vestig vestigial operations that are maintained for certain readers who who pay you know at certain price points. But the future and 99 percent of the the energy at all these places is 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 web based and digitally based and, and involves all kinds of experimentation that would have been unthinkable before that I think a lot of these owners have given 
people not just permission but demanded that they engage in so so a lot of that dynamism is good uh, but no one i don't see anyone who really has a you know perfect solution to this i live in a very small town in montana you know it it, it had once had a vibrant daily newspaper it now has a newspaper that's printed in iowa or no it's printed 200 miles away and edited in iowa and 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 it uh, comes out three times a week. It's very hard to know what's going on in a state that, and so many of our states are in control of one party or the other, 40 of them now, that it's more important than ever that we know what's happening in government. And as a country, it's really important that we know what everybody's doing so we can we can stop making a cartoon of each other. You know, we all have these ridiculous ideas. If I can have one more minute um, uh, about who the other side is, you know, some ridiculous percentage of Democrats think all Republicans, you know, all Republicans make more than a quarter million dollars a year. And some ridiculous percentage of Republicans think all Democrats are black, gay and bisexual. You know, it's just crazy how we have caricatured each other in this country. We have cartoon versions of who we are. And 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 part of the reason is we have no way to find out otherwise. We live in separate worlds. We don't have newspapers to tell us what's going on. Um, it's really not a good formula. Yeah. Um, all right. Final, final, final question I had for you. On that upbeat note. <laughs> you, yeah, exactly. You sat down with, you know, world leaders, the most influential people on earth uh, many yeah. times throughout your career. If huh. today you could have an hour with anyone to ask the kinds of questions that I've asked you today, if you could have that hour to sit down and have a meal with them, who would that person be and why? Well, you know, it'd be fun to get W and Obama in the room together. I've never done that, you know, uh, uh, particularly on this economic stuff about voters and what's become of the middle class in the last 40 years. W takes over in 2000. Obama takes over in 2008. Um, over the, the, that 16 years was followed by Trump, you know, Looking back, we can all see that was a time when we all kind of lost sight of the ball here. Um, and it would be great to have them talk about that, to hear them candidly speak about what they would do maybe differently, what they what what they didn't pay enough attention to, what what got away from them. Um, Clinton's begun to do that a little bit. This, this really that period. Those two guys really. Obama and Bush would be great to have together. I know just who to photograph it, um, and uh, and and I think I think that'd be fun um, and interesting. And it hasn't happened, and I'm not sure it ever will. But I think that would be kind of a a little bit of a we'd be able to pick a lock there a little bit, be like a skeleton key to an era that clearly changed us, and we're only now beginning to understand how much it did. On that. What's the one question you'd like to ask, but you probably wouldn't ask? In other words, I think what's it's, that it's, one? It's, what's what that? would you? Have, what would the two of you have done individually uh, to prevent the rise of Trump and a and a and a kind of politics that is um, poses real risks to the democracy? Mm. You know, what what would we have done as a nation to save? We don't we can even take Trump out of it. What should we have done as a nation in those 16 years? And what could you guys have done differently that would have done more to preserve our democracy for the next hundred years? That would be yeah. the question. As, and as, I bet they've thought of it. I bet they've thought of it. As someone who's a fan of traditional Republicans, uh, I go back to 2012 and think about how the course of history would have changed if uh, Mitt Romney had, had beaten Obama in 2012. Um, but anyway, that's all. That's all. Kind of factual. Yeah, exactly. You got it. Um, <laughs> Michael, um, always great to see you. Stay warm up there in Montana. And uh, oh. thanks for taking the time. I really appreciate Best it. Best to you, Willie. Thanks for having me. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.